<laughs> Mistakes, eh? Everyone in the gaming industry is prone to errors at some point in their careers, whether it be miscalculating deadlines, releasing unfinished games, or just plain screwing up every single thing you have ever laid your hands on for the past two decades. So this episode is dedicated to the funniest of those mistakes, those laughable lapses, and those slapstick solecisms, all of which have mostly been forgotten. Well, until I came along and dug them all up again, that is. <laughs> but hello you, I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt, five hilariously idiotic gaming business mistakes. Should I add you never know at the end, or is that a bit too clickbaity? Mind blowing. You gotta give credit to the Japanese and their whimsical style of video games. I mean, where else would you see a pretty decent shoot 'em up starring a 19th century dragon riding bunny girl who has to retrieve a giant stolen holy door key from a genius robot inventing raccoon? So, to entice people to buy Kyo Flying Squadron's bizarre premise for its UK release, the publisher, JVC, teamed up with British Sega magazine Sega Pro to release a one level demo of the game as a cover disc. Now, demo discs were in their infancy on consoles at the time. CD-based systems were relatively new, so it was quite the luxury. But JVC either didn't know what they were doing in creating a demo, or just got lazy, as what they actually did was stick the entire game on the disc, but added a splash screen after the end of the first level to kick you back to the title screen. Sounds weird, but it's not out of the norm to have a bunch of inaccessible code on a disc. But the idiotic part of this story is, they also left the game's level select cheat in the game, so anyone who knew this cheat essentially had a full price game for free. Well, the price of a cover disc. So JVC inadvertently put the full game of Keo Flying Squadron on the demo disc instead of the actual demo. Needless to say, for some bizarre reason, Sega Pro never printed said code in any of the magazine's future cheat sections. But that didn't stop their rival publications printing it a plenty just to rub salt into the wound. <laughs> but because of this blunder, and the fact a full game is quite the collector's item on the Mega CD now, the actual demo disc also goes for quite a pretty penny on eBay today. In fact, it's one of the most sought after demo discs in the whole of gaming. Let me ask you something. How difficult do you think it could possibly be to screw up a football video game? Have stupid AI? Clueless goalies? Well, Tech Magic managed to screw it up even further than that when they released their kick-off knockoff Champions of Europe for the Sega Master System, quite possibly the most incompetently programmed soccer game in history. You see, as pretty much any three-year-old can tell you, the sole purpose of football is to simply score more goals than your opponent. There. That's it. Unfortunately, the programmers took this info literally and let you score points in either goal. That's right, you can win a match in Champions of Europe by simply kicking the ball into your own net. Obviously this makes it easier to win as goalies in video games aren't programmed for the sporting equivalent of team killing. But if that wasn't bad enough, if there's been no goals at all and the scores are nil-nil by half time, you can quit out and it registers that you won. And even worse, if you finish a match with nil-nil in the tournament mode, it will automatically put you into the final. Needless to say, Tech Magic were either too stupid or couldn't care less about this abysmal bout of shoddy programming, as they never recalled nor revised the game. But that didn't stop Patrick McCarthy giving it 87% in issue 34 of Zero magazine, calling it an excellent game. Dickhead. Originally starting out as a movie license of the Halloween series, publisher Palace Software abandoned the idea after noticing a video game about a witch that collects pumpkins has absolutely bugger all to do with a man in a white mask who continuously hunts down Jamie Lee Curtis. But while Cauldron was a fun little excursion for Palace and a great game to boot, their focus was more on picking up movie licenses to develop games into, and none were bigger to them than the Evil Dead 
a game they had previously developed for the Commodore 64 and BBC Micro the year before. You might remember me talking about it in one of my Halloween specials a few years back. It's an okay game, fun for five minutes, but it soon gets repetitive. But The Evil Dead was popular enough for Palace to want to wrangle a few more pennies out of the license by porting it to the ZX Spectrum as well. So, once completed, they sent both The Evil Dead and Cauldron off to the cassette duplication factory. You can probably see where this is going. For gamers who didn't grow up with tape-based games, cassettes were often temperamental buggers to handle, often failing for the most bizarre of reasons. From having the volume too loud, how hot it was that day, to just not feeling in the mood to load. So publishers would often stick the game on both sides of a tape as a kind of backup. That's or if you're just too lazy to rewind a bloody tape. Unfortunately, either the tape duplicators or Palace themselves had a bit of a brain fart that day, and instead of sticking another copy of Cauldron on the B side of the tape, they accidentally stuck The Evil Dead on it instead. So Pullis accidentally stuck their unreleased AAA movie license on the B side of a budget game. Alright, Cauldron wasn't a budget budget game, but it was on the lower end of the full price game spectrum, £7.99. Of course, Palace Software didn't want to admit this error, so instead put a spin on it saying they wanted to distribute The Evil Dead to a wider audience, completely negating questions of why the other versions also didn't display this unannounced spate of generosity. Ironically, this boast ultimately shot them in the foot, as a lot of retailers refused to sell a game with a game adaptation of a video nasty on it, so the Spectrum version only received a limited release. Oh the irony! Do you remember the days before Ubisoft were creating misogynists with half their faces missing and barely finished AAA games? Guru Larry remembers. But before we were all laughing at their general incompetence, the boys from Paris were aggravating us with their overly paranoid DRM of their PC games. And none was more prolific than their not really that tactical, tactical FPS Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Vegas 2, created during Tom's not dead yet phase of game development. Now, their copy protection was simple enough. All you needed to do is have the disc in your DVD drive when booting the game up. It sounds pretty stupid in this day and age, but for the time, it was the easiest way of proving you owned a genuine copy. However, Ubisoft also released a digital copy on IGN's Direct to Drive of all places. Talk about backing the wrong horse. But since there was no physical disc to prove the copy was genuine, Ubisoft just negated that bit of code from the digital version. Sounds good so far, but Ubisoft then went full derp and completely forgot they had released a digital edition, when their first update patch permanently locked out anyone who didn't own a disc release, assuming it was a pirated copy. This in itself is stupid enough, but this isn't the most hilarious part of the story. Their copy protection was so good, Ubisoft couldn't actually undo it. No matter how hard they tried to repatch the game, they just couldn't remove the new DRM. Not even through a clean install with the original unpatched game. So, what was their solution to this mistake? They simply went on Game Copy World, downloaded a crack for Rainbow Six Vegas 2, and released that as the official patch. Yep, Ubisoft's only solution to remove their own copy protection to Rainbow Six Vegas 2 was to give you the software needed to actually pirate the game in the first place. They didn't even bother to disguise the fact it was the original crack either. They left in the original coder's usernames in the code, and even the crack tro bit tune you get with these programs is still there. Needless to say, Ubisoft went very quiet after this whole ordeal. They stopped encoding DRM into games, and instead went for an all new tactic to deter pirates by releasing future games as buggy pieces of shit instead. If you were a British gamer growing up in the 90s, undoubtedly you would have owned an action replay at some point in your life. Just like the Game Genie, they were a cheat device that would give you infinite lives, skip levels etc, and were immensely popular at the time. 
Heck, I personally like action replays so much, I even got a job as an artist doing the graphics and box art for them. Oh yes indeedy. But enough egotistical insertion. As with all things, popularity doesn't last forever, and by the time the Dreamcast was released in the late 90s, the action replay's popularity has started to wane. So with the ability to release such devices cheaply on CD, the action replay creators, Daytel, thought it'd be a great idea to team up with the biggest unofficial Dreamcast magazine in the UK, Futures DC UK, and offer a demo disc that gave you a small taster of what cheeks it could do for games such as Crazy Taxi and Sonic Adventure. And thus, the Action Replay CDX demo was bundled with issue 11 of their magazine. Unfortunately for Sega, however, the Action Replay could do things other than just add cheats into games. <laughs> You see, since this was an unlicensed product, the Action Replay had to use software to bypass the Dreamcast disc security checks in order for the player to then insert the chosen game to cheat on. So if said player was a little on the unscrupulous side, they might choose to not type in any cheat codes at all and instead insert an imported game. Or even worse, a pirated game. Yup, Daytel did such a good job at knocking out Sega's security checks, the Action Replay CDX demo inadvertently created the entire piracy market for the Dreamcast. It was impossible to pirate games for the Dreamcast until Daytel accidentally discovered a back door, which, as you can guess, opened the floodgates. Of course, this was a huge embarrassment for all concerned. Future desperately tried to pull issues from the shelves, but word had gotten out by then, and gamers were snapping up multiple issues to sell at vastly inflated prices on eBay. Daytel did manage to remove the feature by the time the full version of the CDX was released, but by then, nobody gave a toss, as no one was prepared to pay £40 for a feature a £5 cover disc could do anyway. So the ability to play imported and pirated games mysteriously started to appear in later revisions of the CDX. Funny that. Ironically, Dreamcast sales actually increased after the CDX demo was released, which brought up new coke-like conspiracy theories whether Sega had purposely let the CDX slip through, as they certainly never issued any legal threats to Daytel nor Future. So you can all thank that huge stack of burned Dreamcast CDRs in the corner of your wardrobe existing to Daytel for innocently wanting people to get a taste at cheating in video games but accidentally opening up the doors of temptation to illegal free video games instead. Thanks, Daytel. Hello, you. Thanks again for watching this episode. If you want to check out the other Fact Hunt episodes, the links are on screen now. Or better yet, subscribe to be first to see future episodes. The next episode is going to be a real doozy for you. Also, if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time.